So in this video, we're going to be talking about the new addition to the syllabus, space on frontier. It's basically the highlight of the whole 2023 update right now. So space, completely new unit, new topics, new things to talk about. So let's get started. Obviously, I don't need to talk about what the syllabus update is. It's literally this. It's literally this. I'm gonna be talking about space. And before I continue, Reminder, if you're a core student, year nine student, pre-IGCSE student, if you see this sign, the extended sign, the top of uh, the slide or the side of an equation or something, this is not for you. I recommend that, you, however, that you watch it nonetheless because it'll be useful. It'll help you round out your understanding of the topic in general. Now, what are we talking about? Lots of lots of topics, although I like to classify them into three general topics. We're going to be talking about planet Earth and any details about planet Earth. So the Earth, the moon, the orbiting of the Earth around the moon. We're going to be talking about the solar system itself and what are the things that are in the solar system and how solar systems were formed. So what are the planets that we have? What's a star? How was the solar system formed using the accretion model? Uh, the differences between different types of stars, how do we calculate gravity or what is gravity and how things orbit either the star or things orbit a planet or otherwise. And then we focus more on the big picture, the universe itself. So what is the universe? When we say what the universe, what is the universe? What is it made up? It's made up of galaxies and galaxies have solar systems and solar systems have stars and so on. And what's the life cycle of a star? Like what happens when a star runs out of hydrogen fuel? Does it explode? What does it do? Does it kill us all? We're going to talk about that. Then we'll talk about some proof. I wouldn't say proof, just evidence of a theory that we call the Big Bang Theory. So we're going to briefly mention the Big Bang Theory. And we'll talk about some of the observations we've made over a long time that allow us to support this idea. We're not sure if it's 100% correct, but nonetheless, let's get started. Let's talk about planet Earth. First, planet Earth. We live here, somewhere. I think this is North America and this is South America, but nonetheless, we're not here. I'm probably somewhere here. But the thing about Earth is that it rotates. It rotates around itself. So it spins around itself and it takes 24 hours to finish one spin around itself. Now, the reason why we have a day and night cycle is thanks to this spinning action over 24 hours. Because sunlight comes in from a certain side, just one side. Almost half of the Earth is exposed to sunlight and the other half isn't. So this is nighttime here. And this is daytime here. And then over the next 12 hours, and as the Earth itself spins, day and night changes. You might be saying, okay, cool. Well, that, that's fine. That's easy. We know that. Well, one more thing, though. The rotational axis of Earth around itself is not vertical. Like Earth doesn't spin around itself like this. Think of a top or a spinning disk that you spin. It's not spinning vertically. It's actually spinning at an angle. Don't memorize this value, but it's around 23 degrees or 23.5 degrees from the vertical line. So the axis of rotation is at an angle. And this is going to be very important because it affects the seasons on Earth. So speaking of seasons, Earth itself orbits around the sun. The sun is the center of our solar system. And Earth itself goes around the sun. This takes the Earth 365 days, which we call one year, to complete one revolution around the sun. Now, it's the tilting of the Earth's axis alongside the orbiting of the Earth around the sun that determines the kind of weather we have, or to be specific, the kind of season that we're discussing. So is it spring? Is it summer? Is it autumn? Is it winter? What exactly is it? So how does that work? Well, here's the thing. Take a look. Take a close look at what, what's on the diagram. 
depending on where the sun is and where the axis is, half of the half of Earth, the upper half, the northern hemisphere. Oops, that kind of spoils things. The northern hemisphere is winter, and the southern hemisphere is summer. Right. We were just coming out of our, because we're currently in the north, so we were just coming out of our winter and we're currently in spring, and now we're heading to summer. When the northern hemisphere is summer, the southern hemisphere is winter. But why? Because of the tilt of the earth, the infrared radiation that comes in from the sun does not travel the same distance as it hits the earth. It travels less, at least with, with the axis tilt this way, as it hits the northern hemisphere, and it travels more before it hits the southern hemisphere. So the infrared waves get a bit weaker, so it gets a bit colder. And the northern hemisphere is a lot hotter, so now we have summer. But as, and let me go back back, as the Earth orbits the sun with this axis, the northern hemisphere is now farther and the southern hemisphere is closer. This is farther and this is closer. So the southern hemisphere becomes summer because it's hotter now and the northern becomes winter. So again, thanks to the tilt of Earth's axis, this both affects the day and night cycle and the weather we get, the seasons we get as it orbits around the A, around the sun. One more thing, Earth as a planet has a moon, as in we have a natural satellite that orbits us called the moon. Now this moon takes around 30 days or basically one month, and because it's not exactly 30 to be honest, one month in order to finish one orbit around planet Earth. Now, the orbiting of the moon affects a couple of things. One, it affects the tides on Earth. And we've already mentioned that when we talked about tidal waves before, or like, sorry, high tides and low tides, not tidal waves. But then it also affects the phase of the moon. Depending on where the moon is relative to the Earth and relative to the sun, the sunlight can hit the moon and reflect to Earth. So you see the entire moon, you get a full moon. But if the moon is here, the sunlight hits the moon and reflects back. So we don't get light from the moon. The moon itself is not luminous. It doesn't emit light. It's reflective. So depending on where the moon is around the Earth, certain portions of the moon can be seen because it reflects light from the sun and the other portions don't. So depending on where it is, we get to see more and more and more of the moon. That's why we sometimes see a crescent or a half moon, right? Or a waning moon, or a full moon, or uh, obviously I'm moving this way. So this is why the moon has phases because of its location around the Earth. As the moon is moving away from the sun, all right, it's called waxing because it gets you know lit up. As the moon is moving towards the sun, it's called waning. Because to us on Earth, we end up not seeing the moon properly when it's a new moon. Kind of a weird name, waning and waxing. Anyway, extended part. As the Earth orbits the sun, or any planet orbits its star, you should be able to calculate what we call the orbital speed, or how fast, basically. Does this object move around the sun? So the orbital speed is simple. Speed is distance over time. But what's the distance in a circle? What's the distance around the sun in a circle? The distance is the circumference of the circle. So it's 2 pi r. And the time that it takes to finish one orbit around the sun is called the orbital period. As in, it's the time of one complete revolution around the sun. For Earth, that is one year. For planet Earth, that is what? One year. So it takes a year for the Earth to finish orbiting around the sun. 
This is why when you calculate the orbital speed, it's two pi r over t, with r being the radius of this circle, as in the orbital distance, the distance between the star and the planet we're talking about. In this case, it's Earth. All right? Very good. Before I talk about the solar system, does anybody have any issues? Any questions? All right, we're good. Can you repeat the seasons? All I said about when it comes to seasons is that depending on where the Earth is around the sun, you get different seasons. If the Earth is tilted towards the sun this way, the northern hemisphere becomes hot and the southern hemisphere becomes cold because it's closer to the sun. But if the axis is tilted away from the sun, the upper half is tilted away from the sun, it becomes colder and the lower half becomes warmer. Okay? Good. Now, let's talk about the solar system. Our solar system, which looks like this, consists of lots of different astronomical bodies. When I say astronomical bodies, I mean things like the star, the planets, comets, and such. So let's quickly define what they are, just so we can get an idea. So our solar system has a star, which is the sun, this, the thing in the middle that gives out all of the light and heat of this uh, solar system. You've got a bunch of planets which orbit the sun. <laughs> all right. You've got <laughs> that orbits the what? The sun. I'm sorry, somebody sent me a funny uh, message right now. Then you have minor planets or dwarf planets like Pluto, which after my own heart, I loved Pluto. I mean, it was so devastated when they decided not to classify it as a planet a very long time ago. But we still classify it as a dwarf or minor planet. And that also orbits the sun. Asteroids are just a bunch of rocks that are floating in outer space that were left behind after the formation of the solar system. Or maybe they broke off from a certain type of moon or planet. And they just orbit around the sun as well. Moons, however, always orbit a planet. Because I remember somebody asking me earlier, what's the difference between a moon and a planet? A moon doesn't orbit the sun. A moon orbits a planet and the planet orbits the sun. And then you have a bunch of comets and natural satellites similar to the moon. So you have a bunch of comets flying around the sun. And they also orbit the sun as well. All right. Yeah. Uh, this, there is a very good question posted, which we will answer later. The question was, or currently is, how doesn't the moon get affected by the sun's gravity? It kind of does, but I'm going to be talking about gravity in a bit and which gravity gets stronger or weaker. But the gist of it is the moon is closer to us than it is to the sun. So it gets affected by us stronger than it gets affected by the sun, right? Because it's farther away from the sun than we are, at least even if it's orbiting. So what are the things in our solar system? We have the sun over here, and we have eight planets. The first four planets that are close to the sun, you have to memorize them by name. You don't have to memorize all of these moons and stuff. No, 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 just the planets. You've got Mercury being the closest, followed by Venus. Earth, us, we're here. Mars, uh, Elon Musk wants us to go there, so uh, good luck. We've got a bunch of asteroids, you know, broken rocks and stuff. And then you have four other planets, which we like to call the gas giants. The first one is Jupiter. Saturn is followed by that. And remember, Saturn is very distinct with the strings. You've got Uranus, the butt of all space jokes. Haha, ha, I'm funny, always. I will never stop using that joke. And Neptune. 
You have to memorize them in order and by name. The first four planets are very small and rocky. So Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. The other, the other four planets are giant and gassy, right? Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So that's what makes up our solar system. This is an extended part, okay? There's certain types of data that we need to understand. Don't have to particularly define them, although honestly, you have to be able to define gravitational field strength. But you need to understand what they mean. First, what's orbital distance? It's the distance between a body and the sun. Remember, if we have a planet that orbits the sun, this radius of its orbit, uh, of its orbit this is called the orbital distance. Orbital duration, or what we like to call orbital period sometimes, it's the time taken to finish one complete orbit. Planet around the sun, a moon around its planet, so on. Density, I think that's easy, mass or volume. Some planets have very large densities, some planets have very small densities. Like if I go back, you've got planets that are huge in size, like, like Uranus, for example, or Neptune. They're much larger than Earth, but they almost have the same mass as Earth. It's, it's almost the same. I'm not saying it is. It's almost the same. So it's a lot less dense than Earth. Get the idea? It's just density. Surface temperature, which is the temperature of the surface of the planet. I don't care about the temperature in space. I'm talking about the temperature if we land on the surface. For example, on Earth, our temperatures can range from, I think it was negative 50 to 58, something like that. You don't have to memorize that value, but there is a certain range of temperatures on a surface of a planet that to us at least deems it more habitable or inhabitable. And like it's easy to live on, or it's not easy to live on. But the most important quantity is its gravitational field strength. It's how strong that's planet, that planet's gravity is. It's defined as the force per unit mass. And remember, this had the symbol G. So if you remember from unit one, W was equal to mg. So g is w over m. It's how much weight or force that acts on a certain mass. Certain weight or force that acts on a certain mass. For example, on Earth, and this is a value we have to memorize, the value of g is 9.8 newtons per kilogram, meaning Every one kilogram is pulled with a force of 9.8 newtons. Here it is. Here's Earth. Then what about other planets? And before I continue, do not memorize a thing. I hope that wasn't too creepy and it didn't sound too weird. But do not memorize any of these. Just Earth. But you need to understand what they mean. There are two things to understand. The bigger the value of this G, like Jupiter, for example, is 24 and Neptune is 11.7. I'm comparing it to Earth, okay? This means that the planet has more mass because the value of the gravitational field strength, the value of the gravitational field strength depends on the mass of the planet itself. So the more massive the planet is, the more matter it has, the more mass it has, mm -hmm. the greater its gravitational field strength. Because gravity exists due to mass. You flinched? <laughs> oh, God. Then what about something like the moon or Mercury? They have a much smaller value of G. What does that mean to us? They have less mass. Now, the second thing that you need to understand is that if you go to a planet, if you physically go to a planet with a smaller gravitational field strength, this means you can float around. You will weigh lighter. You will have less weight. You won't lose any mass. You'll just be floating around because you're lighter, less gravity. But if you go to a planet like Jupiter, you won't be able to walk. You're going to be pulled and smacked into the ground and you won't be able to move. All right, good. Continuing on with the analysis a bit. So as we just said, keep these things in mind. The strength of the surface of a gravitational field depends on the mass of the planet. We just said that. But the gravitational field strength around the planet decreases as you move farther away, which makes sense. So if this is a planet, we're here on Earth, and then you leave the planet itself, the farther and further away you are, 
the weaker the gravitational force that's going to be acting on you. So the values of G that I've written down over here, these are the values of G on the surface, not, not in outer space, all right? Now, you asked me a little while ago, why doesn't the moon get affected by the sun's gravity? Why? Because of two things. First, most of the mass of the solar system is in the sun. That's why the planets orbit the sun. So when you have a sun and you have a planet, the planet, the reason the planets stay in orbit is thanks to the gravitational pull of the sun on them. But we just said something about planets, which also applies to the sun, which is what? That the strength of the gravitation field decreases as you move farther away. So here's the question. Is our moon closer to us or closer to the sun? Sure, the sun has very strong gravity, but because the moon is really far away from the sun, the force on it is weak, it could still orbit the sun. But because we're also there and we are closer, or when I say we, I mean planet Earth, and Earth is closer to the moon, much closer, and I mean much closer, to the moon than, uh, than the sun is, our gravitational force keeps the moon in our orbit instead. Right? Finally, the orbital speed of a planet depends on the distance as well. If a planet is very close to the sun, like Mercury, it zooms around very quickly. But if a planet is super far away from the sun, like Neptune, it moves very slowly. Oops. It moves very slowly. Very good. A follow-up question from the same student. Does the Earth get affected by the moon's gravity? We just said that. It does. Not the Earth itself, but the water on Earth gets affected by it, and that affects the tides. But again, which one is bigger? What, which is heavier? Which has more mass? The Earth or the moon? Yes, exactly, the Earth. And since the Earth has greater mass, its gravitational field is stronger than the moon's. So it orbits us. We don't orbit it. You're welcome. You're welcome. Now, the final thing here, so we can go back to some core stuff, would be orbits. So far, I've been talking about orbits as if they're all circular, as if they're all just a bunch of circles, which means that the radius of this orbit is constant. So the gravitational force is constant, but that's not entirely true. It's not entirely true. Some planets have elliptical orbits, meaning it's kind of like an oval. And the sun is not the center of that ellipse. If you take a look, the sun will be closer to one side of the ellipse than the other. We call this a foci of the ellipse. Then, OK, what, what has a circular orbit? What has an elliptical orbit? Some planets do. Some planets do have elliptical orbits. Some of them are circular. Some of them are almost circular. But please keep in mind that especially comets and minor planets, these definitely have elliptical orbits. So when I'm talking about Pluto, for example, this definitely has an elliptical orbit. Additionally, some planets like the Earth, also has an elliptical orbit, although it's very close to being circular. Like if this is the circle, Earth's orbit is kind of like this, slightly longer on one side than the other. So it's almost a circle. So we treat it like a circle. We calculate the radius, we calculate the orbital speed, it's fine. But speaking of comets that move in elliptical orbits, the speed depends on, if you remember, I said, as a planet is farther away from the sun, its orbital speed is slower. Whereas if a planet is closer to the sun, its orbital speed is higher. This also applies to comets as they move in their elliptical orbit. As they move away from the sun, their speed decreases because their kinetic energy decreases and changes to gravitational potential energy. But as you move farther away from the sun, your potential energy increases. But as you move closer to the sun, the speed increases because, again, you're being pulled even closer to the sun, so the gravity becomes a lot stronger. So your speed increases, so your kinetic energy increases, but your potential energy decreases because you're moving closer to the sun. 
Very good. Now, this is core stuff. So focus if you're poor. How were solar systems formed? This is called the accretion model of the solar system. In order to understand this, I want you to remember one very important detail I mentioned earlier. In our solar system, the first four planets that are closest to the sun are small and rocky. The last four planets, the gas giants, are large and gassy. There's a reason for that. And that reason can be explained using the accretion model of the solar system. Like, how was a solar system formed? So here's what we think we know, according to observations. In the vastness of outer space, you've got a bunch of dust and gas, a large cloud, cloud of gas that's spinning and just moving throughout their space. However, I'm sorry. However, as gravity mm -hmm. starts to act, as gravity starts to act on this cloud, the gravitation force in this cloud starts to attract gases towards its center, the cloud starts to spin faster and faster and faster, forming what we call an accretion disk. So this cloud of dust just starts to spin faster and faster and faster. While this is happening, it attracts a or lots and lots and lots of gas towards the center. And this gas collides with each other. And as the gas molecules that mainly contain hydrogen, by the way, let, let's write that down, hydrogen, because it's the lightest element, as it attracts and collides the hydrogen atoms with each other, they start to get hotter and hotter and hotter, and the pressure increases. But the gravitational force also increases, pushing them even closer to each other, and they get hotter, forming what we call a protostar. The word proto, at least when it comes to space physics, means before it becomes something, or like it's in the process of becoming something. So this hot ball of gas in the middle, which is the protostar, starts getting hotter and hotter and hotter until it eventually becomes what we call a stable star, a nice stable star. Now stars are stable because, and, and keep this in mind, I forgot to mention this, as you're collecting hydrogen gas and it's smashing into each other, this hydrogen gas starts to undergo what we call nuclear fusion. If you remember, this is when you have two hydrogen atoms that are joined together to form a helium atom. We studied this in nuclear physics. So basically, we fuse the hydrogen atoms together to form helium and release a lot of energy, which is in the form of heat and light. So this outward force of heat from the nuclear fusion reaction balances out the inward force of gravity of that star. Once that star has balanced out its forces, the outward force of heat and the, due to the fusion reaction and the inward force of gravity, this is now a stable star. It's nice and stable. Now, don't forget, please don't forget, we still have all of the rest of that dust and gas spinning around the Earth. Uh, sorry, spinning around the sun. Now, as it spins faster and faster and faster, some of that dust and some of these rocks and everything else start to clump together. You've got lots of elements in them, by the way. You've got uh, helium still, some hydrogen left, some oxygen, some nitrogen, some carbon, some iron. You've got heavy and light elements as well. They start to stick to each other. And the more they stick to each other, the stronger their gravitational force becomes. And they start to form what we call protoplanets. You can see this, lots of dust. And some of this dust starts to accumulate in certain areas and joins together in certain parts, which are currently in the process of becoming a planet. After a very long time, millions of years, this dust now starts to gather and it creates what we call planets. But one final observation. Due to the heat from the sun, which we call solar winds, but it's basically just heat emitted from the sun. During the formation of the protoplanets, the heat from the sun 
pushes out the lighter elements. Because they're light, they're easily affected by the sun's heat, by the expansion caused by the sun's heat. So they just get pushed out. So the planets that form on the outer end of the solar system are big and gassy because they're mainly made of the lightest elements, so they have a lower density. Whereas the planets that are closest to the sun are small and rocky. Why? Because there are less elements that are light here. It's mostly heavy elements. And that's what we call the accretion model of the solar system, how solar systems are formed. And this explains why the four planets close to the sun, if I go back, the four planets close to the sun are small and rocky, and the large gassy planets are far away because of the whole accretion model and everything else. Yeah. Let's talk about the sun one more time, just to clarify things. The sun is what we call a medium-sized star. Stars are just bodies of gas in different solar systems that release a lot of light and heat and everything else. They have different sizes. Some of them are tiny, some of them are medium-sized like us, and some of them are huge, and some of them are even bigger than the huge stars. So they have different sizes. It mainly consists of hydrogen and helium. If you remember, it's because we said that you have two hydrogen atoms that fuse together to form helium. That's the nuclear fusion reaction we discussed before. But because of this fusion reaction, the types of energy, it emits all types of energy, by the way, all types of electromagnetic waves. So it does emit gamma, it does emit other things, but it mainly emits three things. Infrared waves, which is heat. It emits visible light, which we see. It, and it emits ultraviolet radiation, UV waves. These are the three main things that the sun emits. Very good. Yeah. Finally, let's talk about distances. Before we talk about the universe, we have to specify a unit of distance. Why? Because planets are so far away from each other. Like if this is the sun and we're here on Earth, you know what? If I open up Google, let, let me pull out my phone for a second. I'm going to type on Google, distance between the sun and the earth. This will give us a value of 100, take a look at this, take a look at this, of 149.06 million kilometers. So if I were to put zeros to this, and forgive me, I'm going to ignore the 06, We've got one, two, three, that's for the kilometers. And then one, two, three, four, five, six meters. I think that's kind of far, right? I think that's kind of far. So instead of using values that are huge and millions and billions, and then people get confused, what's a million and what's a billion, what's a trillion and what's, how about we simplify things? Instead, when we're traveling in outer space or we're measuring distances between stars and other stars or stars and planets and everything else, we use a unit called a light year. And it's literally its name. It's the distance traveled by light in one year. This value is 9.5 times 10 power 15. If you want to, you can go work it out on your own, by the way. Like you can calculate the distance of one light year by simply saying, hey, Distance is speed times time. The speed of light is three times 10 power eight. The time, which is one year, is 365 days. But if you want to convert it to seconds, so you can get it in meters per second, you have to multiply it by 24, that turns it into hours. Then you multiply it by 60, which turns it into minute. Then you multiply it by 60, which turns it into seconds. If you multiply these, you'll end up with 9.5 times 10 power 15 meters. That's very huge. That's pretty huge. So memorize this value. One light year, this is for extended folks. One light year is 9.5, 10 power 15. For everyone else, you have to memorize the definition. And know that's how we measure the distances between planets and, stuff, and stars and galaxies. Yeah. This next bit 
No, 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 no. I'm not saying that uh, there is a very good question. I'm sorry uh, for context. So are all planets the same distance from each other? That's not what I'm saying. No, I'm just saying that instead of measuring the distance between planets in meters, so you end up with a gajillion zeros, we make, we created a new unit for very large distances, which is the distance traveled by light in one year. So if I tell you, for example, that you traveled half a light year to get somewhere, what does that mean? It's literally half of 9.5, 10 power 15, which gives you a certain value. So 0.5 times 9.5 gives you, uh, 0.5 times 9.5 gives you 4.75. 10 power 15. Absolutely, yes. A light year is a constant. Do you want to know what it's like? Do you want to know what it's like? It's like if I tell you, uh, um, what's one kilograms in grams? What are you going to say? Exactly. A thousand grams. It's a constant. But instead of measuring everything in grams, we decided to use a prefix and we just use kilograms sometimes. Same thing. We just took a very large value and we changed it into a constant. So we measured everything relative to that constant. Two light years, 75 light years, and so on. You're welcome. Now, take a deep breath. And I ran out of water, amazing. There was a drop in there. Let's talk about the life cycle of a star. This next section of the life cycle is extended. But what do I mean by the life cycle of a star? I mean, what happens to a star when it runs out of fuel? Your brain might be working, what fuel? Remember, we said that a star, it balances and becomes stable. When the nuclear fusion reaction emits an outward force of heat, which is equal to the inward force of gravity of that star. So it's balanced. All these forces are balanced and everything is stable. Eventually, though, that will run out because it will run out of hydrogen, it changes it all to helium. So that's going to happen. Let's see what happens. First, if you remember, we said that our solar systems or a star starts off as a nebula. That nebula collapses due to gravity, heats up, forms a protostar, and then it forms a stable star when the inward force balances out with the outward force of the temperature of the star. Now, this phase, this phase takes millions of years, millions of years, if not billions, depending on the star. The bigger and the heavier the star is, the faster it runs out of fuel. And the smaller the star is, the slower it runs out of fuel. What eventually it runs out? Then what happens? If a star runs out of fuel, depending on its size, if it's a medium star, like the sun, it turns into what we call a red giant, so that you understand the process. Here's the star. Look at me. Here's the star. It runs out of fuel, so there's less heat being pushed, being pushed out, so it's unstable. So the gravitational force collapses the star even more, causing the helium to start fusing, like a new fusion reaction occurs. But because it's now fusing heavier elements, this becomes, I don't want to call it a star because it's no longer a star anymore. This fusion reaction causes this star to expand because it's now restarting the fusion reaction but with heavier elements there's a lot more energy that's running out even faster boom as it expands it actually eats up a few planets in the solar system like it destroys the first three or four or five planets depending on the size of that star it destroys a few planets we call the red giant but eventually even that runs out of hydrogen even that runs out of hydrogen and when it runs out of hydrogen this phase is not very important, but when it does run out of hydrogen, uh, why, I need to write, why did it freeze? Okay, when it does run out of hydrogen, you've got a bunch of dust left, that's called the planetary nebula. It's not very important because that's the rest of the solar system, but I'll get back to it. 
what happens is that whatever is less left at the center of that star, like after it's been completely done and it's collapsed again, it cannot fuse anymore. You're left with this big white dot of heavy matter called a white dwarf. The reason it's called a white dwarf is because it's slowly giving out light and some heat, which is residual energy from when it was a star. Eventually, by the way, and let me add this as an extra, eventually a white dwarf turns into a black dwarf which is basically the same object, but it's run out of light, it's run out of heat, and it's just dark, just a big piece of rock floating around in outer space. Just a big piece of rock floating around in outer space. All right? Great. Uh, I'm not answering that question. Now, obviously, just as an extra bit, and this is beyond the scope of the syllabus, but as an extra bit, whatever is left from this planetary nebula after the like, structure of it, eventually floats around in space, spins, creates new galaxies. You have, you, sorry, new solar systems. You got the idea. But let me go back a second. What if the star that we're talking about is very large? I mean, very large, much larger than the sun. Like, here's the sun. Here's that big star. When this runs out of fuel, it forms into a red supergiant, which means it collapses and then expands again, complete, almost completely destroying the solar system it's in. But then, here's the kicker. It also runs out of fuel. And as it runs out of fuel, it's fusing heavy elements. It's fusing heavy elements. As it runs out of fuel, what happens to it? It explodes. If it's a very heavy red supergiant, it explodes. And when it explodes, this is what we call a supernova. So it's when a red supergiant explodes. And by the way, all of these heavy elements, from the lightest to the heaviest elements, they start to scatter around the universe. This is why we get, you know, different elements in different parts of space. Because these elements remain from the explosions of other supernovas in other solar systems. And eventually this dust uh, forms new nebula and everything else. But now what's left behind? This red, super, uh, this red supergiant has now exploded into a supernova. What's left? If it is very heavy, its gravitational force becomes so strong that it fall, forms a black hole. Or if it's heavy, just not as heavy as the other star that forms a black hole, it forms what we call a neutron star. This is literally when protons and electrons, the gravitational force here is so strong, it fuses them together and it becomes a neutron. All right? Oh, this is a good question. Is a black hole like a black dwarf? No. You see, a black dwarf is kind of small. So it's just a piece of rock. Sure, it has some gravity, but a black hole has extremely strong gravity. I mean, gravity of a black hole is so strong, it attracts light. Like if you have light coming from another star and it's trying to pass through and around the black hole, that light gets attracted into the black hole and you don't see it. That's why we call it a black hole. Because when you look through a telescope, in outer space, you will see lots of little dots and colors and everything else from all the dust and all of the stars and other things. But a black hole is literally like a hole in our picture. It's like somebody used some very dark ink and he erased whatever it is was there. The only reason we know there's a black hole there is because there's this weird ring of light around it because that's the light that gets distorted as it travels away from the black hole, like it's far away from the black hole and bends a bit. So it makes it look weird, it attracts light. So again, how does a black hole form? If you have a supernova, which is when a giant, uh, sorry, a red supergiant explodes, whatever is left in the center either turns into a neutron star or it turns into a black hole, depending on its mass. The heavier it is, 
the bigger of a chance of it becoming a black hole. The lighter it is, it becomes a neutron star. All right? Obviously, like we said, whatever bad residue is left, this, this nebula that's left behind, all of that dust that's thrown away and it's left behind, this could start forming new stars and new solar systems and new planets and so on. Very good. Now, finally, let's talk about the universe. Let's end this session by talking about the universe. The universe is huge. It consists of billions of galaxies. We, we can't count them all. But we live in a galaxy called the Milky Way. Like our star, the sun, is in a galaxy called the Milky Way. Maybe it's here. Maybe it's here. Maybe it's here. I don't know, honestly. I just put this arrow in because it looked cool. You know, like these mall maps that say, you are here. That's basically what it reminded me of. Like, hey, look, we're somewhere. We don't know where. So anyway. Probably none of these, by the way, because we're the ones taking the picture. So we're the ones taking the picture, huh? Anyway. <clears throat> I digress. But the thing is, even the Milky Way, let's assume that we're looking at the Milky Way. The size of the Milky Way is approximately 100,000 light years. You need to memorize this value. Sorry if you haven't heard it before, but you need to memorize this value. The size, the diameter of the Milky Way is 100,000 light years. Can you imagine how large our galaxy is? By the way, the distance between us and the sun is a lot less than one light year. So it's a very big distance. All right. But how do we know that there are other galaxies in the universe? Because we see them, sure. But one idea is that, if I go back to this picture for a second, one idea that we have is that this universe doesn't have a fixed size. This universe is actually expanding, like it has a limit, and it's now growing beyond that limit. So we're assuming that over time, the size of this universe is increasing and increasing and increasing. We call this the Big Bang Theory, where we assumed that the entire universe started off as a little dot, an infinitely, infinitely small dot of mass and energy and then it exploded boom and then when it exploded it scattered all of its mass and energy and then that universe started to get bigger and bigger and bigger because it has its velocity it's not slowing down it's just moving far away but how do we know that this is true one of the observations that convinced us that this could be true is redshift basically as a planet or Sorry, planet was the wrong term. As a star or a galaxy moves away from us, the wavelength of the light emitted by that galaxy increases, especially compared to something that is stationary. Like if you have a stationary star that's sending us light, it has a certain wavelength. It doesn't change. But as other stars move away from us, the wavelength of that wave gets stretched out. So as the universe expands, it stretches that wavelength more. So wait a second. If you remember the electromagnetic spectrum, when it comes to light, visible light, it was Roy Gibbet red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. If And red had the lowest frequency, violet had the highest frequency, but red also has the longest wavelength with violet being the shortest. So any light, blue, indigo, whatever it is, that's emitted by another star, as it reaches us, because it gets stretched out, it looks, a mo it looks more and more red. This is why we call it redshift, because the wavelength increases a bit. So it, to us, the visible light looks a bit more red than it should. And this doesn't just apply to light. This applies to any electromagnetic wave emitted by that star. 
It applies to uh, infrared, it applies to gamma rays, it applies to everything. All of them get shifted a bit. Sometimes we even draw a spectrum, by the way. Like if I draw the spectrum that we know, uh, gamma rays, for example, if I start with gamma rays here and radio waves here, and you have certain regions of the spectrum, this entire spectrum shifts. If this is the longer wavelength, the gamma rays don't start here. The gamma rays start here. Then you have your x-rays and then you have your other things until you get your radio waves way over there. So all of the waves start to have a longer wavelength. They shift. That's why we call it redshift. It just, it doesn't fold, it just stretches. The actual wavelength emitted by the star is the same. It's because, here's the thing. If my right hand is emitting a wave like this, pew, 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 it's emitting a wave. That's fine. It's still the same blue color, for example. But as it emits a wave and it moves back, what has happened to the wavelength of that wave? Because it just burst out that wave and oops, I'm moving farther away. I'm sorry, I've now stretched that wave. So I emitted the same wave. I emitted blue. But because I moved, it changes. And this happens also to sound, by the way. We call it the Doppler effect. Like if you have a car, and I've done this several times already, so if you laugh, that's up to you. But do you, do you know what cars sound like as they move towards and away from you? What does it sound like? As a car moves towards you, it goes like, and then as it moves away, it goes like, right? I, I, kind of like that. When a car moves away from me, the sound becomes lower pitched because its wavelength gets stretched. And if a car moves towards me, it sounds higher pitched because the waves get compressed. Do you know what's the opposite of redshift? If a planet or star is moving towards us, we call it blue shift. It's, it's a really beyond the scope of the syllabus. It's beyond the scope of the syllabus. But this happens whenever something that's emitting a wave moves either towards you or away from you. Because every star that we've observed in outer space is redshifted, this was the first piece of evidence that told us, hey, uh, ahem, all of these things are moving away from us. So if they're all moving away from us over time, that means what? If they're all moving away from us, that means what? This means the universe is expanding. The, the universe is getting bigger. And it's continuously getting bigger. Yeah. A second thing that proved to us that, or is, is a piece of evidence that supports this idea. If I toss you into outer space, we're here on Earth, and we, we decide to fly out into outer space. Thank you, space. Thank you, Earth. And goodbye. And thank you for all the fish. If you get that reference, you're, you're a goat. Anyway. So as you fly out in outer space, if you decide to measure if there's any radiation in outer space, you will find a lot of radiation. But what was funny is that no matter where in space we send out uh, we won't say people, honestly, but we send out drones or like sensors or satellites. We found out that there is always some kind of microwave radiation that's observed anywhere. So we call it cosmic microwave background radiation. Background radiation, just like atomic physics, but it's not gamma rays, it's microwaves coming from outer space. Where did it come from? So here's the theory. The idea is that this energy was emitted during the Big Bang. So it was released when the universe was formed. But it originally had a shorter wavelength. But because the universe is expanding, the wavelength of that wave keeps getting stretched and stretched and stretched and stretched and stretched until it eventually became a microwave. So you can think of it like, hey, when the universe blew up from that point, at least that's what we think, it blew up from that single point, the Big Bang. It started off maybe as gamma rays, but then that wave started to get stretched over time, over billions of years. Until now, it's currently at microwaves. And by the way, even that microwave's wavelength over a very long time will continue to increase. 
the frequency will continue to decrease. Maybe it won't be a microwave anymore. Maybe it will be a radio wave after a few million years. Who knows? But that's an idea. So if I ask you what is cosmic background radiation, it's microwave radiation of a certain frequency observed in any point around space. How does it support the idea that the universe you know, is expanding? So we simply say it was produced during the Big Bang or when the universe was formed. And as the universe is expanding, its wavelength was increasing until it reached the microwaves region. And finally, last but not least, the Hubble constant. What is the Hubble constant? We've already agreed that the universe is expanding. So let me draw a few circles to emulate that fact. We started off as a very small dot, and then the size of this universe keeps increasing, increasing, increasing. So how do we measure that? Like, how do we measure how far it's increasing? Well, uh, I can observe another star. Like, if we're here on Earth, and we're looking at another faraway star, if we can measure the distance between us and that star, and we can measure the speed at which this star is moving away from us, we could find out how fast is the universe expanding. Because the assumption is us and that other star were originally one point. If we, if we all started from the same point, we were originally one point. So technically, and we're assuming here, technically speaking, if we can measure how fast this thing is moving away from us, not just the speed, it's just how fast it's moving away from us and the current distance it has, we can know the rate at which the universe is expanding. That's what we call the Hubble constant. It is simply a ratio of the speed at which another star or galaxy is moving away from us over the distance. So it's just the speed divided by distance. Look at the units, look at the units. The speed is meters per second and the distance is meters. They'll cancel each other out. So it will simply give you a distance or something per second. This is the ratio at which the universe is expanding. We get the velocity using redshift. We have not studied the formula. We will not study the formula. But we can use the velocity from, or we can get velocity of another galaxy using redshift. We can measure the frequencies. We can measure the wavelengths. We can estimate the speed. You can also get the distance between us and another galaxy using the brightness of another star or a supernova. Depending on how bright that supernova is, we can tell uh, how far away it is. Now that we've measured both, we can calculate the Hubble constant. And right now, and you memorize this value too, this Hubble constant is around 2.2 .2 times 10 power negative 18 per second. That's the rate at which it's expanding. One final thing, if this is the rate at which it's expanding, if you inverse this ratio, you're literally dividing distance over speed. If you remember speed is distance over time, then time is what? Distance over speed. Do you see what I'm getting at or what I'm getting at? If I divide the distance between us and another star and the speed of that other star, no, 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 it's not going to be a light year. Light year is just a unit. This will tell us how much time did it take for that other star to move away from us. Wait, didn't I just say we assumed that the universe started at a point and then we separated? Like, you know, star-crossed lovers, long-distance relationships. When was the last time you called your, you know, significant other? You shouldn't have one right now. It's not anyway. So when was the last time we called each other? <laughs> don't, don't do that. No. A very long time ago, a few billion years ago. So if I can find out the time that it took for that other galaxy to move away from us, assuming we're all the same point, that is the age of the universe, which is literally the inverse of the Hubble constant. So if I divide, and this is just for fun, this is just for fun. You don't have to memorize this. But if I divide 1 over 2.2 10, 10, 10 to the power of negative 18, if I, if I work this out, 1 over 2.2 10 power negative 18 
This will give us 4.54 times 10 to the power of 17 seconds. Let me, let me change this to, uh, to years so we can get an idea. So in order to change it to years, we'll divide it by 60 and another 60 and 24 and 365. This will give me 1.44 times 10 to the power of 10, which is 1, which is 14.4, 10 power 9. 10 power 9 is a billion. So our current assumption is that the time that it took for another galaxy to move away from us, which is the age of the universe, is 14.4 billion years. That's very fascinating, honestly, but it's all assumptions based on certain measurements with a big amount of uncertainty, by the way. We're not 100% sure. So, uh, what about the syllabus? So what, sh what should I memorize? Well, one, you should memorize what does the Hubble constant even mean and the ratio itself, V over D. You should briefly know that we can get the velocity using redshift of another galaxy and distance using the light from the supernova of another galaxy, the brightness. And finally, you should memorize this value, 2.2, 10 power negative 18. Thank you very much. Oops, there was an error here. This is space physics, not nuclear physics. Anyway, I'm human. I make mistakes. Thank you very much for listening. I'll see you guys next time.